Hi! So in this episode of Center for Tax Studies Individual Income Tax Course, we're going to be discussing personal exemptions and dependency exemptions. And the name of the game here is how many exemptions can I claim or can I steal? Not literally steal because we don't condone fraud in this course, but how many can I claim legally so that I can reduce my tax as much as possible? So with no further ado, let's get started. discuss what is the personal exemption and the dependency exemption. And a really good way to discuss that is to show you where it is on the tax return. So here is your 1040 for 2016. And if you go through, you'll see that there's income, your deductions, your, your adjusted gross income, and then it will come down to your deductions from adjusted gross income. And there you'll see on line 42 are the number of exemptions that you can claim. You determine how many exemptions you can claim by what you put on the front of your tax return. You determine how many exemptions, personal exemptions you can claim on line 6A and line 6B for your, you as the taxpayer and your spouse if you are married. And then if you have dependents, you also list them here. You then add up all of those on the right hand side to determine the number of exemptions that you can claim right here. So the rule is that everyone gets their own exemption. And for 2016 and 2017, that amount is $4,050. So as we were sarcastically discussing in, last, uh, in the last episode, that you get a certain amount of a standard deduction to be able to live um, at the poverty level as gracious as Congress has been, you get to claim your standard deduction and your personal exemption. So if you are single, you get to claim 6,300 as your standard deduction plus $4,050 as your personal exemption. So essentially you get $10,350 to live off of, good luck. Um, but that's the amount that you can exclude from income on your tax return before you have to file, number one, which we'll talk about in another episode, as well as what that amount, that baseline is before you then start being charged tax, um, which we'll also be talking about in another episode. If that is the amount of your personal exemption, then the question becomes, how can you steal, because that's the name of the game for this episode, how can you steal other people's exemptions? Well, legally, you can take those exemptions if they are not claimed as a dependent for, on somebody else's tax return. The question then becomes, can you claim yourself and get your own personal exemption? Well, you can if you're not a dependent of somebody else. And you can take your spouse's exemption if you file separately and that other person does not earn any income. Those are the only instances in which there are issues with your own personal exemption. So now we want to figure out whether or not we can steal other people's personal exemptions legally. And there are two rules that you have to look at in order to determine whether or not you can take somebody else's. And the two rules are if they are a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. So as you can see in the qualifying child and qualifying relative rules here, there are six tests that you have to look at or six factors. These are the relationship test, the support test, the abode test, the age test, the joint return and the citizenship test for the qualifying child. And for the qualifying relative, it is the relationship test, support, test, gross income test, joint return test, and citizenship test. So let's first go over the qualifying child test. This test was designed to provide a uniform definition of child for all purposes. Although the definition of relationship is uniform, the age, citizenship, and residency rules vary depending on whether this is a dependency exemption that you are trying to qualify for, or you're looking at the child tax credit, the dependent care credit, or the earned income credit. So for this purpose, we're going to talk about these rules as it relates to the qualifying child test. So the relationship test in the qualifying child test 
requires that the child must be either the taxpayer's child, including adopted child, stepchild, foster child, placed by an authorized agency or court, a child placed for adoption even if the adoption is not final, or it can be your brother or sister, your stepbrother or sister, a half-brother or sister, or any descendant of any of the above that we've discussed. You cannot claim as a qualifying child anyone who is older than you or who is a relative who is not a child of yours or your siblings. The support test is generally irrelevant unless the dependent provides more than half of his or her own support. So this precludes a taxpayer for taking the personal exemption away from a child who is supporting himself. Scholarships are not support. And so when we're trying to determine whether or not the child is supporting his or herself, that child cannot provide more than one half of their support. But support includes things like clothing, food, um, a place to live, as well as necessities of, of life or a car or a television or anything that you're providing to help support that child, that then becomes a part of the support test. Abode. The abode test is that the child must have lived with you for more than half the year. Now, temporary absences are disregarded. So these temporary absences include school, vacation, medical care, or if you place your child in a juvenile facility or a military service detention in a juvenile facility, that child still meets the abode test for the qualifying child uh, dependency exemption test. Age. So this child must be either under the age 19 or under 24 years old and a full-time student. A full-time student is defined as being full-time in school for some part of five months during the year. So it's tragic when graduation happens sometime in April, because if it happens sometime in April and that child is younger than 24 years old, all of a sudden you do not get to claim that child in that year as a dependent. Had that, uh, had that graduation happened in May, then that would be a completely different story. Also, age is determined on the anniversary date. So this was an issue when there were kids born on New Year's Day. Because a child has lived 365 days, if they were born on January 1st, they've lived those 365 days on December 31st. Well, now there's no question as to whether or not you are a dependent in the year before, so in 2016 on December 31st or in 2017 on your birthday on January 1st. The rule now is it's on your anniversary date or the January 1st um, birthday. That's when you are now a different age. Okay. Age requirement, however, does not apply to a disabled child. You can always claim the dependency exemption for the qualifying child test for a disabled child, no matter what their age. The joint return test only applies if you have a married child and they're living with you and they haven't left the nest. So a married child who files a joint return with his or her spouse does not qualify as a qualifying child unless they only filed a return to get a refund from withholding. No tax liability would otherwise exist if they are filing married, filing separately, and neither spouse is required to file a return. If any of these do apply, you are not, you are all of a sudden disqualified as a qualifying child, but you may be able to qualify as a qualifying relative. And lastly, you have the citizenship test. The child must be a U.S. resident or citizen or a resident of Canada or Mexico to be able to qualify. There is an exception for an adopted child. The child 
does not need to be a citizen or a resident of the United States as long as that child lives with the U.S. citizen even abroad. For example, if you are living in Switzerland and you adopt a child from Africa, even though the child is not a resident or a citizen of Canada, Mexico, or the United States, as long as they are living with the U.S. taxpayer, then they do qualify as a qualifying child. So now there are some tiebreaker rules if a grandparent, a parent, another parent, or an uncle can all claim the qualifying child as a dependent. The first person who gets priority is the parent. If one of the taxpayers is a parent, then the parent prevails. The next is residency. If both parents qualify, the parent with whom the child resides the longest prevails and will get the dependency exemption. Next is the taxpayer who has the highest AGI. If the residency period is the same, the parent with the highest AGI prevails. So now let's say that there is no parent involved. The taxpayer, the uncle or the grandparent with the highest AGI then prevails. It then goes to who is next in line. So if the taxpayer does not claim the dependency exemption, the next in line can then claim the dependency exemption. For example, Bobby is age nine and he lives in the same household with his mother and grandmother. Who prevails? Mom. Mom gets priority to be able to claim the dependency exemption on her tax return. Another example, let's say Lean is age 16 and lives in the same household with her parents during the entire year. If her parents file separate returns, the one with the higher AGI has priority. Now assume that Lean's father moves into an apartment in October. Lean remains with her mother. Now who has it? Well, the person with the longest residency prevails and therefore her mother gets priority to claim Lean as a dependent on her tax return. Now let's move on to the qualifying relative test. The first test for qualifying relative is whether you are a relative or a member of the household. So you are a relative if you are not a cousin, this includes in-laws. So you can never get rid of your in-laws. Even if you divorce, your in-laws are still your in-laws. The only person that you are no longer related to is your ex-spouse. Tough if you don't like your in-laws. Now, cousins don't count because you are related to everyone in some way. So everyone at some point is your cousin, whether they're 300th removed. And therefore, Congress has decided to limit the people who are your relative to everyone, including in-laws, but your cousins. Now, members of the household, anyone who is not a relative, a direct relative to you, including your cousins and your ex-spouse, must live in the house with you for the entire year to qualify. So for example, let's say that you have Joe, your next door neighbor, all of a sudden he, no, he needs a place to stay because he's been kicked out of his family's house and you graciously allow him to live with you. Well, he has to live with you for all 365 days in order for you to be able to claim him as a dependent on your tax return, as long as he meets the other tests of qualifying relative. Now, we talked about your ex-spouse being a member of the household. This can only happen after the year of divorce. So if you decide to live with your ex-spouse the year that you are divorced, you cannot claim them as a dependent even if they are squatting in your home. But once they are no longer, once it's the year after, then if they're squatting in your home still and you haven't evicted them, then they can be your dependent. Even if they're not squatting and you're helping them out, they are your dependent. I'm just trying to liven it up here because we're talking tax and let's make it a little bit fun. Support means that the taxpayer, you have to contribute over one half of support. Support here also includes food, shelter, clothing, toys, medical, education, travel, etc. Capital expenditures also may count if owned by the individual. These include a TV or a car, etc. 
Now, income that is earned but not spent does not count towards support. So if you make $150,000 a year and you only contribute $10,000 to your depend the person you're trying to claim as a dependent support, but they provide $30,000 in the form of food, shelter, clothing, etc., you cannot claim them as a dependent even though you made more because you didn't provide that as support to that individual. Scholarships also do not count as a form of support. Gross income does not apply in the qualifying child test, but it does apply in the qualifying relative test. Dependents must have taxable income in order for this gross income test to even start applying. Non-taxable income does not count. The taxable income must be less than the exemption amount of $4,050 for 2016 and 2017. If they make more than that, then all of a sudden there becomes an issue and you cannot claim them as a dependent. Income from married dependents is determined whether or not they live in a community property state or not. So if two married individuals are living with you and you want to claim them as a dependent on your tax return, if one spouse makes $4,000 and the other spouse does not, in a community property state like California, Arizona, etc., these individuals are treated as if they both earned that $4,000 and therefore, it's treated as one spouse made $2,000 and the other spouse made $2,000. If they are living in a non-community property state like Utah or Texas or etc., then their income is treated as one spouse earning $4,000 and one spouse earning $0. If one spouse makes more than that exemption amount, then all of a sudden, you would not be able to claim that person as a dependent. The joint return test and the citizenship test for the qualifying relative test are the same as the qualifying child test. A multiple support agreement permits one of a group of taxpayers who furnishes support for a qualifying relative to claim a dependency exemption for that individual even if no one person provides more than 50% of the support. The group together must provide more than 50% of the support, but any person who contributes more than 10% is now entitled to claim the exemption if each person in the group files written consent. For a multiple support agreement to properly work, a Form 2120 or Multiple Support Declaration must be completed and filed on the tax returns with signed statements from all people who could claim the dependency exemption waiving their claim to the exemption. So now let's talk about special rules for divorced parents. The rule is that you can claim a dependency exemption if you could have claimed it if you were married filing jointly. And that person has custody of the child for more than half the year, or in terms of divorce, you have primary custody. Generally, the custodial parent gets the exemption. The non-custodial parent can claim the exemption if the custodial parent signs form 8332 or the release of claim to exemption of child of divorced or separate parents, or if your divorce decree is prior to 1985 and awards the dependency exemption to the non-custodial parent. Now this is important because Form 8332 must be signed for the non-custodial parent to claim the dependency exemption. If it is not signed, even though the divorce decree says the non-custodial parent gets the dependency exemption, or there's an alternating of who gets the dependency exemption, it will always go to the custodial parent. This is because of the IRS rule that was established in a case called Corello v. Commissioner. It states that state courts, by their decisions, cannot determine issues of federal tax law, 
and the language in a divorce decree purportedly given to a taxpayer the right to an exemption does not entitle the taxpayer to the exemption if the signature requirement of Code Section 152E established in Tax Form 8332 is not met. Whoa. So the problem here is that federal law trumps state law. And so if a state court establishes that a divorce decree is going to give the non-custodial parent the dependency exemption, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because federal law has come down and said that a form 8332 must be signed for the non-custodial parent to get the tax exemption. And therefore, if there is an audit, the IRS will look at a divorce decree and say, we don't care that the non-custodial parent should be getting this. Federal law says that the custodial parent does. And so it must be written in the divorce decree and an 8332 should be signed by the custodial parent relinquishing that at the time of the divorce and establishing what years are allowed to be claimed by the non-custodial parent. Okay, so now let's talk about phase-outs of the exemptions. We have a new phase-out in the fiscal cliff. A reduction of 2% of the exemption for each 2,500 or fraction thereof where AGI exceeds this threshold will be reduced on that exemption. So for 2016 and 2017, the amount of the AGI threshold is listed below. So if you're filing a joint return, you have to make less than $311,300 on a joint return to claim the entire $4,050 dependency exemption. And the other thresholds are listed below. So let's go through an example. Taxpayers are married filing jointly with two personal and two dependency exemptions for tax year 2016. Their AGI is $350,000. So what is the amount of their deduction for their personal and dependency exemptions? So the first thing that we do is we determine what the threshold is. So for married filing jointly in 2016, their threshold is $311,300. So you take their AGI and, their, and you reduce it by this threshold. You're left with $38,700. Now, every $2,500 equates to a reduction in a 2% fraction. So we take the $38,700 and divide it by $2,500 and this equals 16. You round up if you get a fraction. You now multiply this 16 by 2% and this leaves you with 32%. So now there are two personal exemptions and two dependency exemptions or four exemptions in total. So now you multiply the amount of a personal exemption by the amount of exemptions you can claim. Here you get $16,200 in the amount of exemptions that you can claim. And you multiply this by 32% because that's the amount of the reduction in the phase out that you must take. This is the amount of the phase out. So now you take the amount of the phase out that you had and you subtract that from the amount of the personal exemption that you could claim. The 16,200 you reduce by 5,184 and this equals 11,000 $16 or the new amount of your personal and dependency deduction. So now I just want to quickly discuss tax fraud here. There's a lot of tax fraud that goes on in personal exemptions and stealing personal exemptions from either people who are fake people or people who are not living in the United States. And also just blatant, you take somebody else's dependency exemption when they didn't even qualify under the qualifying child or the qualifying relative rules. Now this frequently happens among minority groups. Um, there are a lot of minority tax preparers out there and they will tell you that you can claim however many people you want or they will even elicit you to take people who don't exist. And so 
the IRS so far has thwarted about a billion dollars in tax fraud each year, but this still continues where somebody will put down 10 dependents who are either fake or they're living in Mexico or in Vietnam or in other areas. I'm not targeting any minority group. But it does happen and it happens all the time. And if you do claim somebody as a dependent, this is criminal activity. You can be fined large fines and even go to jail for such activity. There are special rules for kidnapped children. The child satisfies the residency test of being a qualifying child for all years ending during the period in which the child is missing if the taxpayer's child is presumed by law enforcement authorities to have been kidnapped by someone who is not a member of the family of the child or the taxpayer, and the child shared the same principal place of abode as the taxpayer for more than one half of the portion of the tax year preceding the kidnapping. Now, the child is also treated as meeting the residency test in the year the child returns if the child has the same principal place of abode as the taxpayer for more than one half of the portion of the tax year following the date of the child's return. Unfortunately, the missing child ceases to satisfy the residency test in the taxpayer's first tax year beginning after the calendar year in which the child is determined to be dead or, if earlier, in which the child would have attained the age of 18. Okay, so on that happy note, thank you so much for watching this episode of Center for Tax Studies Individual Income Tax Course on personal and dependency exemptions. If you liked this episode, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment box below or you can email me at centerfortaxstudies at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.